Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me and honor to speak to you here. And I must admit that I'm, I'm not a pediatric ca uh, cardiovascular surgeon. I did it 20 years before, but uh, tw since 20 years, I only do adults. That's, uh, I think, that you must know. So it is a great pleasure also to talk about the Ross operation. And I find the headline uh, excellent. Is it, is it a perfect solution? This is a, a good question. So this is a problem. Look here. It is a bicuspid aortic valve, and we tried to, to type it a little bit to get some standardization in the whole spectrum of the uh, bicuspid aortic valve. It can come from only two leaflets to three leaflets with a raffi. It is type 1 because it is one raffi. It is situated between the left and right coronary sinus, so it's called type 1 LR bicuspid or bileaflet aortic valve. This is the problem, and this causes stenosis. This is a lot of calcification here, and this, I think, I, I cannot do it. I cannot repair it. I think this valve has to be replaced to save the life of the patient. What are our... Uh, current valve substitutes, what we have, the bioprocedures. And you all, uh, all, all know that the problem of the bioprocedures is the degeneration. And the younger the patient is, the earlier is the degeneration. The mechanical valves have the problem of thromboembolism, of bleeding and anticoagulation. And it is not only the thromboembolism of big emboli causing an extra cardiac disease, Imagine if such a patient, this embolus, uh, goes into the heart, so she has a, a stroke, and lifelong problems with the consequence of a mechanical valve, not related to the heart, but in other organs. And it is not only the macroscopic thromboembolism. You have uh, probably heard that these mechanical valves produce microemboli, with every closing mechanism, microemboli occur, and these are embolized into the brain, more or less up to 80 microemboli per hour in some mechanical valves. And that is not quite sure if these microemboli cause some neurological deficits. So it's not quite easy with the replacement devices that we have. And this is the other alternative, this is the autologous pulmonary valve uh, replay, uh, uh, uses, and is it really perfect? So we as surgeons, and I think everybody agrees, that everybody wants to achieve normal conditions because we think normal is perfect and that's right. Nature is absolute perfect. And therefore, the native aortic valve is the blueprint for a perfect aortic valve substitute. Let's have a look on the normal aortic valve so that we can get an imagine what we want to get. This is the normal aortic valve sitting in the center of the heart. It looks at the first glance a relative a simple structure like a sheath of collagen flowing in the stream. But if you look a little bit further by endoscopic view into the sinus, we can see here that there are strong cords connected by very thin cords and hemong shaped uh, membranes between it, the strong cord here, you can see these smaller uh, cords, collagenous cords. There is a cross section, a strong cord, a smaller cord here, and again a strong cord with these membranes here, like a hanging bridge. And these cords have a wavy configuration for stress absorption. So absorption. And there are valvular interstitial cells on these collagenous fibers, and these cells are in connection with each other in a crosstalk here by adhering junctions, shown by adhering junctions with n catherine painting or staining. There is a communication between these cells. And even more, they can react on external stress. It's shown here for endothelial cells, but the same occurs also for the vascular endothelial cells. It is for mechanotransduction, though they can adapt to to external mechanical forces, and uh, these can cause structural changes, but these can also cause functional changes, as shown here. The aortic leaflets, they can contract 
after vasoactive uh, active substances. If you run very strong, no adrenaline or adrenaline is in your blood increase and the leaflets will contract to reduce the stress. And there is also an innovation in this, this is shown for the pulmonary leaflet here, and there's a reflex mechanism between the pulmonary leaflet and the right ventricular outflow tract, and probably the same holds true for the aortic valve. And we heard this morning from Professor Gittenberger de Groot this uh, miracle in the development of the, the, uh, myo, uh, the, the cushions, the mesenchyme of the cushions, during a, a special period in the development, in the tube development, some cells, they get a transition from the endothelial endocardium to the mesenchyme um, the prototype, and they migrate to the endocardial cushion to form or to create the leaflets. It's incredible mechanism taking place. And it is getting even more crazy when you remember that neural crest cells are migrating to the area where the semilunar valves are formed to help to produce or to develop these fine structures. Why is that necessary? This is because there is a fine-tuned concert of motion of all components of the root. All structures are distensible, cooperating and interacting with each other. Only one example here. This is the opening... Oh. This is the opening of a leaflet, and you see that during systole, this leaflet is already closing. And this is because they, the leaflet wants to reduce the stress that is opening, and during systole, it's already closing, and only in diastole, it's closing a little bit. And this takes place because there is a constriction in the base radius, as shown here. And this causes a flow, acceleration, and a venturi effect sucking the leaflets into the middle, an ingenious concept. So, no, I am already at the end. How can I proceed now? Welches soll ich drücken hier? Bist ein ein Problem damit? Ja. Entschuldigung. Okay, it's, it's my, my fault. So, this um, causes this, this anatomic and functional relationship causing a fine flow without any disturbance, with any vortices in the outflow tract. And you can easily see this is the sinus here, the sinus there. There are vortices in the sinuses, and there is a flow constriction, flow acceleration here, sucking the leaflets into the middle, making a systolic closure. And this was already known by Leonardo da Vinci 500 years ago. And he said the left ventricle helps to close the aortic valve. And he also painted this excellent paintings, and interestingly, he didn't sell it until his death. So I show you, this is a normal aortic valve, and if we only change a little bit the compliance of the wall, this is the David operation, in the compliance of the wall is reduced by the Dacron tube, which replaces the wall of the uh, aortic root, and you can see that that at once causes a bending stress in the leaflet when we only change the compliance of the aortic root, which does not occur in the normal aortic valve here. So the valve, the aortic valve, the nature is extremely complex, extremely precise in form and function. And this takes place three billion times in a life. So, these are some of these characteristics I, I told you. And if we want to get a substitute which imitates some of these characteristics, this is most likely met by the autologous pulmonary valve. So the Ross operation um, originates from this idea, and it is attractive to replace the aortic valve with this healthy autologous semilunar pulmonary valve. At the end, the Ross operation is a double semilunar valve replacement with double risk, that is clear, with the hypothesis that the autograph in the aortic position is near to normal in function and durability. The replacement of the pulmonary valve in the low pressure circulation is less problematic because there is less degeneration of the homograph due to the low mechanical stress, the blood pressure is lower and probably the adaptability of the right ventricle if some kind of stenosis occurs. 
The general assumption is that the ROS operation is advantageous to conventional aortic valve replacement and may provide near normal conditions. So what, when we compare now the pulmonary autologous valve with the aortic valve, we see that there are th the same design, three leaflets, three sinuses, same histology at birth. But the pulmonary autograph does not have muscle and fibrous skeleton in the annulus, but only muscle in the annulus. This is already one difference between the aortic root, aortic valve, and the pulmonary valve, and this may explain the sometimes seen dilatation of this device. If we look at the valvular cells, we can see that the qualitatively uh, are very similar. The pulmonary aortic valve, but it's only a quantitative difference. And if we look now into the procedure itself and what we are doing, I think we should have a little view on the philosophy. And this is Karl Popper, one of the greatest philosophers of the last century. He said everybody has his or her own philosophy and theory of cognition. Everybody sees it the same way. As you just heard it from Dr. Stamm and me. Somebody say the Ross operation is ingenious and the ideal aortic valve replacement, and others say, okay, I don't like the principle of the Ross because pay, all patients have to be reoperated. But what is the truth? Is there really only one truth? Karl Popper further said that the approximation to truth is possible. Safe knowledge of truth is prohibited. Safe knowledge of truth is prohibited. Our knowledge is critical guesswork. We are working around the truth, a net of hypotheses and assumptions. This understanding, and this is very important, may lead to some intellectual mod modesty. Be it as it is, it is, I think, our responsibility to careful follow-up, and this means more than 95% follow-up what we are doing. And therefore, we implemented the German-Dutch Ross Registry. These are the members, and now there are some more members, and we call it now the European, before the Czech and Austria. And now we have more than 2,000 patients, 260 children, more than 95% completeness of follow-up, and this is what I went, want already uh, um, to say, the papers were presented with the results from Ross and Dr. Stamm, how is the completeness of follow-up? If you look at the paper, this is the first thing that you have to look at. And these are the different techniques. This is a subcoratory technique, this is original. You implant the autograph into the root. You have no problems with dilatation. We have now experience with more than 600 subcoronaries and never have seen any dilatation of the root. Then you can do the root replacement. 470 patients in our register, more now than 700. And now the pulmonary root is standing free. And this is a completely different uh, problem. Or you can do a free root with a reinforcement of the annulus and the sinotubial lunction. And now we will see how these different techniques behave in the long term. First of all, some operative techniques you see here the expansion of the autograph and it's a big surgery opening the right ventral outflow tract and this is a muscle here pointing to the first septal branch and when you dissect here you have to be careful not um, cutting through the first septal branch. It occurred to me several times and it's always a problem. You have to stitch very close to the annulus of the pulmonary autograph and you have to do if in dilated dimension of the annulus, a reduction anuloplasty putting out outside a piece of dacron, a strip of dacron secured inside from one trigon to the other to reduce and stabilize the annulus as was already said. We have uh, in, uh, developed a, s a special suture technique with a traction suture followed by three normal over and over sutures and then again a traction suture so very easily can slip in the autograft into the root in exact position to have it annulus by annulus. This is a complete implantation, looks not so bad. This is for an example where you cannot use the autograft in my mind because there's a big fenestration here more than the line of coaptation and if here you can, you can get, if you put it in as an autograft uh, risk of endocarditis here, and I had some patients to reoperate because the fenestrations were the location where endocarditis occurred, so I do not use it anymore. So now we come to the results, and I think the, the biggest thing, the biggest result is the survival. 
patients want to survive. And now we have, I show you 200 and patients more than 10 years of follow-up of our series, and they have a normal survival. And this is what I also want to say. When I see survival curves, what does it mean? I want to see the relative survival. I want to see the revival in relation to the normal population. And this is a relative survival, and this is 100%. And these are our complete series, more than 600. It's not com different to the German population, and if you look into the registry. So there is a survival in the ROS patient that is not different from normal after 10 years. The pa question is, is this a bias of patient selection or is it real ROS re related? And this is a randomized controlled trial given us an answer on this question, and you can see uh, there is a, a significant difference in the survival after 10 years between an allograft, as a homograft on the left side, and the ROS operation here. So this is randomized control prospective. Well, there seems to be more and more evidence that the ROS operation per se has some survival advantage. And again, this is a prospective randomized trial. With between a ROS and a mechanical valve showing in adults, showing that after 10 years, the mortality in the, the mechanical valve is already 40%. After 10 years in 49 years old patients. And um, so the conclusion of this paper is that there is significant less uh, valve related complications, better hemodynamics, better survival for the ROS. Now we come to the um, children. And we have already seen this. That is a survival, also a survival advantage. This is a propensity-adjusted comparison. It is not prospectively randomized, but propensity-adjusted, showing that the mechanical valve had, has a worse survival. And look here, after 16 years, uh, already 20% mm, of the patients are dead. They are dead, not alive anymore. No reoperation, dead. So this depends probably on the size of the valve. And interestingly, I found a paper now from 20, uh, 2012 showing that the survival of a mechanical valve on a bioprocedure is different, and it was surprising to me that the bioprocedure had a worse prob uh, probability of survival than a mechanical valve. So a mechanical valve seems not such bad in the adult population. Now we come to the function. And you see here the blue line is the Ross patients after stressing with 100 watts, and there is no, there's no difference to normal, or even better than the David and the Jakub operations, and better than the three generation bioprocedures with a pressure gradient, mean pressure gradient of 10 millimeter mercury after exercise. So I think the hemodynamics are quite good. The long term um, development of regurgitation over 13 years. There's some increase in the subcoronary technique of aortic regurgitation, but if this is aortic insufficiency grade one, it is much worse in the group with root replacement without reinforcement. With reinforcement, the results of development of aortic regurgitation are not bad. There is no difference between tricuspid and bicuspid aortic valve. The bicuspid is no contraindication to the ROS operation. And this is the uh, reoperation rate on the pulmonary outer graft comparison uh, uh, patient, uh, children again. Adult patient, there's no difference. And the risk factors for reoperation are the root replacement without reinforcement. And these are probably the pictures which we have just seen from Dr. Stamm. And poor aortic insufficiency is a risk factor and also the number of patients operated in the center. So we have some risk factors for a ROS. Now coming to the homograft. The homograft is developing a pressure gradient in the first two to three years, then staying relatively stable, but there is an increased pressure gradient. The homograft regurgitation keeps relatively stable over time, but the reoperation rate on the homograft in the ROS patients, in the uh, pediatric and the children group, is increased compared to the adult group here. That's the results from the registry. If we take now together the reoperation autograft and homograft, and I think it has to be evaluated together, then you can see that there is a difference between the subcoronary and root reinforcement technique being free of reoperation after 15 years in 85% of the patients, but there is an increased rate of reoperation in the free root. Uh, 
um, therefore unless reinforcement is so important. And now patients come in and ask me when they get a ROS operation, how is the probability that I get a reoperation if I get, for example, a ROS operation at the age of 30? In the best case scenario, as uh, the operative technique, aortic uh, stenosis, and so on, the reoperation rate in a 30 year old patient is around 40% in his life. Uh, which uh, we consider to be 70 years of age. And with the, with the other operative technique or, or worst-case scenario, it is quite higher, so the selection of the patients and the operative technique is very important for the probability of reoperation. What do we have for alternative? This is all bi bioprocedures showing here, and this is the ROS operation in age group less than 40 years of age here, and you can see that most patients have already a reoperation after 10 years, and the ROS is a big difference. This is a new generation biopsies. There's no difference between this, uh, these two kinds of biopsies. So when we have a patient with 40 years of age, he must uh, consider that he has a 30% risk of reoperation after 10 years and only 10% with the ROS. If you look into the child group, the uh, children group, we can see that this reoperation is quite higher because of the homograph problem. This is allograph comparison and homograph in children, the same reoperation rate. And we have seen this picture reoperation, but now we come to another problem: is thromboembolism, ROS operation, no bleeding, very low thromboembolism, but the um, ROS operation is not free of thromboembolism and not free of uh, bleeding because also in the general population you have some kind of bleeding and uh, uh, thromboembolism. So it's not, we do not know if it comes from the valve or from other things. Look at the flow velocity. This is ROS during peak systole. This is a xenograft, a homo um, bioprocedures homograph. So also the flow acceleration is almost better than normal because the orifice area is extremely large in the ROS. Looking at the distensibility of the root, among the three techniques I showed you, the ROS techniques, only subcoronary grafting allows preservation of physiological autogram valve dynamics, flow and distensibility at all root levels. What about the growth? There is a growth potential with a subcoronary te technique shown with the red bars here and the green uh, points they show with the free root replacement, some dilatation also in children. So again, we must have some constraints with the ROS in the aortic root. Looking at the flow, this is normal. I'm very grateful to Dr. Riggers, Claude Hansen, and Professor Kramer from Kiel Hospi, who provided me with the MRI for D flow. This is ROS in the ascending aorta. Uh, we, show we have no um, vortices here, also in the homograph, no vortices probably comparable to the normal situation. So are there innovations in the ROS? Yes, desolarized homograph. Better hemodynamics, less reoperation, growth potential question. This is a recellularization of a decellularized homograph, but it is in sheep. If this occurs in patient is another question. We implanted those decellularized homographs, the so-called sunograft, in patients, and you can also see that there is a constriction of the homograph similar to the conventional homograft and the pressure gradients were not different after three years in these patients. So in my experience, it was not a progress, but there is another homograft now in the clinical evaluation from the Hannover group showing that there is also a decellularized homograft, that there is a gross potential in children with this kind of homograft and hopefully this will uh, reduce the rate of reoperation in the uh, uh, right side of these patients. The pressure gradient is the lowest after five years in this kind of new homograph, decelerate, well, there seems to be some progress on the right side. So I come to the conclusion. Characteristics of the pulmonary autograft or a aortic valve replacement. The positive characteristics are same development origin of the aortic valve, same design and gross anatomy of the aortic valve except the annulus. It is viable, it's autologous, has growth potential, but there are open questions. The impact of surgery, techniques, experience, denervation, ischemia, a leaflet, wall is a difference. The impact of acute expo exposure to high pressure and oxygenated blood, yeah, the tissue alterations, adaptation, aging, degeneration. So 
after 18 years experience, my mind is that the survival seems to be in their normal and there are more and more evidence that survival advantage is real, probably real with the ROS. The hemodynamics are near normal, the root is sensible normal, flow near normal, risk of thromboembolism is low, no anticoagulation, bicuspid valve, no contraindication, reoperation is the main shortcoming. The risk is around 1% per patient year at all patient ages, but higher in the children because of the homograph problem. So what's the future? I think we have to continue with the registry, at least 95% follow-up, lifelong is necessary. And this registry is not industry sponsored. And we have to take care to reduce the reoperation rate. And the target is surgery, patient and autograph selection. Autograph selection, very important. Not every autograph um, should be used for the ROS operation. And the technique, reinforcement of the annular sinotubal junction, extremely important. Or the subcoronary original technique. So you have the whole root, the original native root of the aortic valve as a constraint for, um, for dilatation. And you have really no dilatation with this technique. The next point is blood pressure control. These patients must have a low blood pressure at least half a year after the operation. Prophylaxis of endocarditis is very important because the homograph is sensible to endocarditis. And do we have a next generation of deceleration? That is very important. After a follow-up time of 18 years, the results show that the ROS procedure has some favorable aspects, but it is still an evolving surgical method. It is not perfect. But what is better? We have to improve the outcome, hopefully, a little bit to come a little bit nearer to the ultimate surgical goal, the normal conditions. And in general, I like to say that nature is incredible, ingenious, complex, singular, and this is problem also the, the problem with standardization and language. Seeing an optimal solution for a particular purpose, there's nothing better. But our knowledge is absolutely incomplete. That holds true also for the aortic and pulmonary valves. Also, it's our intention to imitate nature. Today, we cannot create the same physiological autologous valve tissue. All we do in valve operations has limitations. This must be known by physicians and also the patients. But we are a lot better than these pictures show. Nothing could be done through the medieval times to, to young to children, young adolescents, or old patients with aortic valve diseases. Uh, only 60 years ago, these, um, these big uh, um, uh, progress in medicine occurred with the introduction of, uh, aortic, uh, of the heart-lung machine. So we are much better than 60 years before our time. And it is great to, to get pictures from, from this lady, got a Ross operation through road. You can read it yourself. And every two years we get a new picture with new children. Thank you very much for the attention.